Comcast Metrophone is proud to sponsor Philadelphia's fabulous sports memories. Recognizing the city's rich sports tradition, Comcast Metrophone salutes the teams, players, and most importantly, the fans who have been there to share Philadelphia's greatest sports memories. Comcast Metrophone, the cellular service more people connect with. Jaworski, gives off inside, running room, but coming up the right side. I'm Bill Campbell, and I've seen a lot of sporting events in this town in my day. Most of the time, it's been pretty forgettable. But every so often, our local athletes have risen to the occasion and taken the Delaware Valley with them to the top of the world. They were a brawling bunch of Canadians who were accepted as Philadelphians as they skated and fought their way to two straight Stanley Cups. A baseball team that featured two future Hall of Famers on the field and one in the broadcast booth. A football squad that handed a legendary coach his only championship defeat. And a generation of kids whose scrappy play turned an aging arena into a mecca of college basketball. We've all shared these moments when our sports heroes captured lightning in a bottle, if only for a few moments. Let's relive some of those moments, beginning a half century ago with an Eagles team that rode to glory on the back of the most brilliant runner of his time. Steve Van Buren was a 220-pound halfback drafted from LSU in 1944. He had a unique combination of power, speed, and agility, and quickly established himself as the top runner in the NFL. He played offense, he played defense, he did everything in the era of the 60-minute man. I played safety. I ran back punts and kickoffs. I led the league in punts and kickoffs one year. I was almost the fastest guy in the league then. You know, people didn't think I was, but I was. Eagles head coach Earl Greasy Neal built a powerhouse lineup around Van Buren. Like fellow running back Bosch Pritchard, pass catcher Pete Pijos, and unflappable quarterback Tommy Thompson, all protected by a ferocious offensive line. After losing the championship to the Chicago Cardinals in 1947, the Eagles were poised for revenge in 1948, but had to face not only a tough Cardinals team, but a raging blizzard as well. They called me at home late, and I said, you can't play today. And they said, we're going to play. And I, I took three trolleys to get to the ballpark. Then I had to walk about four blocks. And we played, and uh, it was snowing so hard that I couldn't see their safety man. Before the game could begin, the players pitched in and helped the grounds crew remove snow from the field at Shy Park. Those were different days indeed. The snow continued to fall heavily throughout the game, testing the skill of the players and the fortitude of 28,000 hardy fans. Couldn't tell when you were out of bounds. They had to guess. The ice is the worst, because you can't stand up. I fell down in the, in, on the ice. Coming out of the huddle, I fell twice getting to the line of scrimmage. Not surprisingly, there was no score at halftime. Finally, at the end of the third period, quarterback Thompson ran a sneak to the Cardinal five-yard line, setting up a plunge by Van Buren to pay dirt and the only score of the day. I rolled over it. The snow took me over. After 60 bone-chilling minutes, the Eagles had their first of two consecutive championships as the snow continued to fall on Old Chive Park. To be a Phillies fan is to learn quickly the value of patience. After winning the first pennant in the club's history back in 1915, two world wars would be fought, five presidents elected, and an entire generation reached maturity before the fighting Phils would again challenge for National League mastery. 
By the late 1940s, new owner Bob Carpenter had rejuvenated the minor league system and the front office, paving the way for a brash new group of young players. The fight, fight, fight and fill. It's a tough, tough team to be. They're out to win, win every day. Every victory is sweet. And what a bunch of young fight and fills they were. At infield, boasting names like Wakeus, Hamner, and Jones. A strong and versatile outfield of Sisler, Ashburn, and Ennis. The sturdy veteran Andy Semenek behind the plate. And a stellar young staff of Roberts, Simmons, Miller, and Constanti. The fight, 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 fight. It was a cast of characters assembled by a scholarly baseball man from Rhode Island, Eddie Sawyer. I was brought here by Herb Pennock to uh, develop some young players to fill in the gaps in Philadelphia because they'd had an older team for many years and hadn't won. In fact, finished last a lot of years. This was uh, sort of rewarding to see them develop the way they did, and uh, we were very fortunate. It was very rewarding. In 1950, for the first time in years, the Phils were actually fighting for a pennant. But into every Philly season, some rain must fall. The Korean War was heating up, and Kurt Simmons' great season was interrupted by a call from Uncle Sam. It was uh, actually a little frustrating, but I was a young fellow, and uh, I knew we were going to uh, get into the service. We went to Indian Town Gap for August 1st, I think it was, and uh, we were there five days or so, and then they said, uh, everybody go home for 30 days and uh, uh, get your self, uh, get your uh, everything cleaned up, and then you, we're going to be activated September 5th. So we re reported to the Armory in the Broad and Diamond uh, September 5th, 1950, and we were, we were in the service, and a week later we were shipped to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. The loss of Simmons, plus injuries to Bubba Church, Bob Miller, and Andy Semenik, turned a comfortable August into a nail-biting September. On October 1st, the Phillies clung to a one-game lead over the Brooklyn Dodgers. It was the last day of the season, and the pennant would be decided at Ebbets Field. The Phillies called on their Dodger killer to do the job. I think I beat them five or six times that year, and they may have beaten me one or two. Over the course of my career, they beat me more than I beat them, but it was fairly close, and uh, it was an exciting thing, but it was a year that I did personally uh, win over them. It's 1950. In the bottom of the ninth, with the score tied at one, at Dodger Cal Abrams at second base, Duke Snyder stepped to the plate. Field. Ashburn races the ball. Here comes the throw from center field. He is out. Richie Ashburn's throw saves the game. Hey, the this Bills. is a play I've practiced a thousand field. times, charging a ball, fielding it, and throwing it accurately, which I did on that play. The ball got to me in a hurry. Uh, I made a perfect throw to home plate. And Cal Abrams was out by, you know, 20 feet. It wasn't, wasn't a bang-bang play. And when you get thrown out that far, you shouldn't have gone in the first place. Now, uh, the third base coach, uh, I think, made the mistake of sending Cal Abrams home because if they keep him at third, the bases are loaded, nobody out, and the hitter's Jackie Robinson. In the 10th inning, Dick Sisler made the Dodgers pay for their mistake. All the time in the Dodger Stadium, or Ebbets Field, and the um, fans would reach out from left field, and they'd catch the ball, and they'd say, well, it's a double. See, this, this went on for years and years, and everybody in the league complained about it, but nothing was ever done about it. And all we were hoping the ball would go deep enough so that they wouldn't be able to, and it did. It went up about third or fourth row. As 35,000 broken-hearted Brooklynites looked on, Roberts mowed down the Dodgers in the bottom of the 10th, and the Phillies had won their first pennant in 35 years. 
and the guy hollered out of the barracks, uh, sister hit a home run and uh, everything's great. So we won the game and that night, Robbie and a bunch of the boys uh, called me from the party. And of course, uh, Willie Jones, he, he had a few drinks and he was, uh, but I, I understood him, but they were very happy that evening. <laughs> Three days later, the mighty New York Yankees, who were healthy and well-rested, came to town to open the World Series. The tired and battered Phils never had a chance. They fought valiantly, but lost all four games by a grand total of six runs. For the Phillies and their faithful fans, the ultimate in baseball glory would have to wait for 30 years. As the 1950s rolled on, the Eagles went from champions to also Rams in the NFL. But in 1958, the Birds brought in an old pro quarterback, whom they had once beaten for their second straight league title. He was the Dutchman, Norm Van Brocklin, and with the help of two young receivers and another old pro, he led the Eagles to the promised land in 1960. He had had the experience of working with Elroy Hirsch and Tom Fears in Los Angeles, two of the greatest receivers that ever played in the league. And so when, when Van Brocken would make a suggestion on a pass pattern, or, you know, you were listening very attentively, and usually it turned out that he had some good advice to give you. The great thing about him is when you would come back to the huddle or on the way back, he would ask you for information. What can you do on the guy? Can you get a post for a touchdown? or? or a corner for a touchdown. That was what was great about him, and you could tell him, and uh, the guy would, you know, you were like a little scout. The old pro was Chuck Benarek, who was entering his 11th NFL season in 1960, and was the last of the 60-minute breed. It really happened in 1960. I decided that at my age, at 35, I was gonna play one more year and that physically the easiest position on the football team is the offensive center. So I became an offensive center and I think it was around the fourth or fifth game we played the Cleveland Browns in Cleveland. And on the first play of scrimmage Bob Pellegrini got hit from the blind side and he was done. And out of a clear blue sky, had no idea, Buckshaw said, Chuck, Chuck, he said, get in there. And of course when the World Championship game came along, Buckshaw told me ahead of time, Chuck, I'd like you to play both ways. The Eagles' road to the championship was paved with two late season victories over the arch rival New York Giants. And the pivotal play in that series involved Bednarik and Giant star receiver Frank Gifford. Well, it was late in the game. It was about a minute and 50 seconds to go. And of course, they got a pass to go down. This pattern is difficult. Down and in. That's murder. You know, here you are, you're looking at the ball coming here, and here comes a mock truck, and by time, just as you catch it, whoom, and it, you go backwards, and your head snaps, and the ball goes in the air, and he's down, and he, he's out like a light, and I saw the ball pop up, and I saw Chuck Weber recover it, and when he recovered, and unbeknown to me, right behind me was the prostrate body of Gifford. I don't know that he's out, and I turned around and I went like this, this effing game is over and click. They got the picture of me with him standing there. And those are the exact words because I never gloated over injuring anybody. On their sidelines, your quarterback, Charlie Connolly. You cheap shot, you this, he's calling me names. Now, I, I said, I'll get you next week. It was a back-to-back -back game. They got to come here to Franklin Field next week. I said, I'll get you next week. Sure enough, we came here. They scored 16 quick points. We won the game 31-23. But Charlie Connolly never finished the first quarter, second quarter. Third. I harassed him. I kept coming. He pulled away and he dropped the ball and all that stuff. He never got to finish the ball game. I really harassed him. I scared the hell out of him. On December 27, 1960, Vince Lombardi led his Green Bay Packers to a frigid Franklin Field to take on the Eagles in the NFL Championship game. The Green Bay squad featured such stars as quarterback Bart Starr, fullback Jim Taylor, and runner, place kicker Paul Hornung. After trading mistakes for a quarter and a half, Hornung's right foot was the difference, 
in a 6-0 Packers lead. But late in the second quarter, Van Drocklin electrified the 70,000 fans with a lightning strike to McDonald from the Green Bay 35. All there is is ice right there, and I was like on roller skates. While I thought everybody was trying to help me up, they wanted the ball. Get the ball, get the ball, get the ball from him, you know. I'm thinking this guy's, you know, trying, not even helping me up or anything like this. And finally a guard gets over there, and the guard, you know, starts pulling on my arm, you know, and here's this guy pulling on the ball, you know, trying to get the ball. <laughs> that was funny. Minutes later, kicker Bobby Walston split the uprights for a 15-yard field goal to give the Eagles a 10-6 halftime lead. After that, the game plan was to keep the Packers' strong running game bottled up. They were just good. They were great up the middle. And they had that one sweep where Fuzzy Thurston and the guard pulled out. And geez, that blocking, it was like a couple of bulldozers coming at you. So that was the big play for them all the time. Otherwise, it was up the guts. The strategy worked until the fourth quarter, when Starr hit Max McGee for a six-yard TD and a 13-10 Packer lead. But on the ensuing kickoff, Eagles lightning struck again. Return man Ted Dean took the kick and spread it 61 yards to the Packer 39. Several plays later, it was Dean again, plunging in from the five to regain the lead at 17-13. But the Packers would not give up. With eight seconds left, Starr passed to the Eagle 22-yard line, and the fate of the season was down to the last play of the game. You got a pass, so the ball was snapped, and we all dropped back, and everyone was covered, and then Jimmy Taylor swung out. And of course, Bart Starr saw nobody, so he threw him the ball, and he started to take off. And I, I still can recall Don Burroughs coming up, and he bounced off him. A couple other guys bounced. And then I actually made this initial stop on a nine-yard line, and then the guys came along, and we knocked them down, and I could still see him laying with, with his face up against me, and he was throwing some expletives at me to get them off of him. And I could see the clock in that end zone going five, four, three, two, one. And when it was over, I said, you can get up now. This aim is over. And I don't, I never acted like these kids today. I jumped up and down because we were the world champions. As the jubilant Eagles carried Coach Buckshaw off the field, no one could know that this was the last time Vince Lombardi would ever lose a championship game. It was wonderful to be a world champion, you know, for a whole year and to bring a world championship to the city of Philadelphia. They call this building the Palestra. And to enter is to immediately come under the spell of the players, the coaches, the fans, and the games that have made this place the country's number one mecca for college basketball. The Palestra has been home to the Big Five since 1954, when the schools agreed to play each other in an annual city series. In December of 55, it started. St. Joe's, Rhode Island, LaSalle Muhlenberg was the first doubleheader. So here was a chance to play each other, play good outstanding teams coming in at a place that seated the magic number of 9208. I can remember watching so many St. Joe Villanova games here. And as soon as the, the Wildcats would get a lead, and of course the fan, the, their fans would be on, let's go Wildcats with the staccato applause. And then of course when St. Joseph's, as it inevitably did, would come back of course, they'd be yelling, uh, let's go, St. Joe, and the big bass drum, and the, the, the hawk, which was one of the first of the mascots in sports. And of course, for years, a, a tradition that started in Philadelphia with the Big Five was the throwing of streamers. Uh, for many people, it's more than just basketball. The palestra was where uh, some men and women had their first dates. What people saw on their dates was something unique. 
Young men who had played each other in the schoolyards became stars in their high schools and now were dueling each other in college. No other city in the country had anything like it. What they did for the 40th anniversary, 94-95, Dan Baker, the executive secretary of the Big Five, got together with the Daily News, and they did a, they printed a coupon for about 10 days to pick your all-time Big Five team. I think you picked 10 players. That's what they end up with. They honored the team at halftime of the Temple Penn sold-out crowd at the Palestra. Before the game, they had the men and women's inductions into the Big Five Hall of Fame. The greatest assemblage of collegiate basketball talent in the history of the United States stands here tonight. And usually when I get too sentimental and I feel a tear, I put my glasses on. I had my glasses on all night that night, I'll tell you. The Big Five's biggest moment in recent years was not at the Palestra. It took place in Lexington, Kentucky on April 1st, 1985, as the Villanova Wildcats topped the heavily favored Georgetown Hoyas for college basketball's national championship. In recent years, the Big Five has recognized the contributions of its women's teams. But the pioneers who really put women's college hoops on the map weren't from the big city schools. That distinction goes to a tiny Catholic college 20 miles to the west, where in the early 1970s, a group of kids who had no scholarships, no gym, and a part-time coach captured three national titles and the nation's imagination, the mighty Max of Immaculata. Well, if you ask the nuns at Immaculata, it was a miracle, of course. I came to Immaculata in 1970. There was no national championship at the time. My salary that year was $450, and I really looked at it as something to do when I would stop teaching and start my family, just a, a low-key job, something to do in the afternoons and keep myself involved in sports. The five players that started on the first ever national championship team were all commuters. They would come to school, drive in in the morning, go to their classes, go to the novitiate, which is where we practiced across the street, get in the car and drive home. I had no trainer, no assistant coach, no manager, no budget for sure. The Mighty Max may not have had much in the way of money or facilities, but their fans sure could make a joyful noise. Rennie Muth Portland was a junior when I came in as a freshman for Immaculata, and her father owned a hardware store. And every game, okay, he would bring a large number of ordinary buckets, and people would use anything they could possibly use to bang on them during the course of a game to cheer us. And it was great. After each particular game, he would pile them all up and take them home with them and then bring them to the next game. Led by star center Teresa Shank, the Mighty Max fought their way to a berth in the 1972 National Women's Championships in Normal, Illinois. But there was one roadblock, how to get there. So we would go to people's houses, knock on doors and say, would you like to buy four toothbrushes for $2? and we'd tell them our story and they'd buy four or five sets, they'd give us $10 and this is the way that we raise money to travel. The traveling party included eight players, the coach and three fans. Seated 15th at a 16 team field, the Mighty Max shocked everyone, including themselves, by winning four straight, including the title game, 52 to 48 over Westchester State. And when we won the national tournament, all 12 of us stood in the center of the court and hugged, and that's all that was there. <laughs> and when we arrived off the plane, there were hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people crying, hugging, laughing. It was great. It, there's pictures of that scene and confetti, and it, it was sensational. I think Immaculata proved to a lot of people that women could get publicity, women could draw a lot of fans, that they could be self-supporting and could play a brand of basketball that people would pay to watch. What started as a part-time job for a young coach turned into a phenomenon. The Mighty Max three straight national titles did nothing less than put women's basketball on the map 
once and for all. There was a rising young star on the basketball horizon a few years ago in Philadelphia. He was Wilt Chamberlain, nearly seven feet tall even then. Who was the Wilt Chamberlain the broke the tradition of local high school stars playing at local colleges. He went from Overbrook High to the University of Kansas. In the late 50s, after a brief stint with the Harlem Globetrotters, he returned to town as the franchise player on the old Philadelphia Warriors, surrounded by a solid cast of players, including fellow local whites, Paul Arison, Tom Gola, Guy Rogers. As good as they were, the Warriors could never conquer the great Boston Celtics and their own legendary center, Bill Russell. Of course, Bill Russell was the spearhead of that, of that team, but, uh, I never really played him one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, he had a lot of help uh, in guarding me with Casey Jones coming down from the weak side guard or Heinsohn coming from the weak side forward. It was a team effort that they used against our particular team. People like to think of it as a one-on-one -on -one situation, but I'm afraid it wasn't one-on-one. -on -one. It was team against team, and he had the better teams, and he helped to make that team a better, better team. But uh, when I look back in retrospect, I mean, hey, we were the second best team of that era, and they were the best but it was frustrating. In his Warrior days, Chamberlain achieved perhaps the most extraordinary feat in sports history, scoring 100 points against the New York Knicks on March 2nd, 1962 in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Back to Rockford, in the Chamberlain. I've talked to at least maybe 75,000 people myself who claim that they saw me that particular night. Either they saw me at the game, or they saw the game on television, or they saw it in New York. They saw it maybe, maybe even in Paris or London, somewhere they saw it. But uh, they all were there, and they all, they all saw it. And uh, I just wish I had a dollar for it when I talked to them since they saw that game. After that season, the Warriors moved to San Francisco, and Wilt went with them. In 1963, the Syracuse Nationals relocated to Philadelphia with a new name, the 76ers. Three years later, Wilt was back in town with a new coach, a new cast of characters, and a new focus. But he wasn't out there to score 50 points a game. He was more concerned with giving out assists, and he had the ability to make his teammates better players and not be concerned about his own individual goals which, uh, or statistics which would come just with his presence on the court. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that year Wilt led the league in assists, which I don't know, I don't think has ever happened before or may never happen again from a uh, center. A talented squad featuring six-man Cunningham, forwards Luke Jackson and Chet Walker, and a backcourt of Wally Jones and Hal Greer were the beneficiaries of Wilt's generosity. The Sixers blitzed the NBA for a 68-13 record and found themselves confronting their old nemesis, the Boston Celtics, yet again. Well, we had a great basketball team. Yet, though, when we played the Celtics uh, uh, in uh, the semis of that particular uh, year, you still were afraid that they were going to pull out some old magic and be able to maybe uh, do it one more time. All the magic this year belonged to Philadelphia, displaying the same brutal efficiency in the playoffs that had marked their season. The Sixers won three of the first four games against the Celtics. On April 11, 1967, at Convention Hall, the Sixers, led by guard Wally Jones, were ready for the kill. Wally had as fine a game as I've seen an individual have in game five against the, uh, uh, the Boston Celtics. Uh, he, in the third period, I'm sure he was close to 20 points in that one period and just blew the game open himself. And we had an insurmountable lead of 20, 30 points. And uh, Luke Jackson going the length of the court to lay it in. And there's Bill Russell trying to chase him down to block the shot. And, and that always had a lasting impression that I, I just, trying to reflect, I'd say, he probably didn't believe what the scoreboard said, you know, that there's a mistake, that uh, they punched up the wrong numbers because this doesn't happen to me in the Boston Celtics. But it had happened. After eight years of frustration, Wilt and company had finally vanquished the lordly Celtics, but it wasn't time to celebrate yet. There was obviously a great deal of excitement and jubilation in the locker room, but Wilt Chamberlain would not allow himself to get excited at all. We still had to beat the Warriors. 
once we did beat the Celtics, I think that we thought it was all over, and we had kind of forgot about the West. And, uh, you know, they had Nate Thurman and Rick Barry and some really good basketball players of, of their own, but we did not approach that series as if it was really a World Championship Series. We thought the World Championship Series was against the Celtics, and we almost had to pay for that. When the sixth game rolled around, we realized, hey, wait a minute, we're in a dogfight here. We're up there in, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. We knew that we didn't want to come back for a seventh game, and we said, let's get this thing over with. And that's just what they did, finally prevailing over a tough and talented team they had almost taken for granted. A large crowd of happy and long-suffering fans greeted their returning heroes. After conquering the Celtics, the world championship against the Warriors was more like the icing on the cake, or in this case, the Boston cream pie. After their triumph in 1967, the Sixers endured a swift and deep decline, and it would be another 16 years before they again reached the pinnacle of the NBA. By 1983, Billy Cunningham had become head coach, and the Sixers were making noise again. We always had very good teams, and then uh, Moses came up. We always knew Moses, how great he was, and then he had to blend in. We all had to blend in with him, but we had the kind of players and the kind of people that once we got everyone together, we knew something special was going to happen. And special it was. The Sixers won 65 games of the regular season, featuring the defense and court savvy of Bobby Jones and Cheeks, along with the offensive punch of Malone, Andrew Toney, and Julius Irving. Doc was always a runner, and it seemed as though every time I got the ball to, to, to run on a fast break, Doc was always trailing me, and he was always somewhere in the vicinity of myself with the ball. So uh, any anytime I got the ball going to the hoop, I always knew Doc was coming, and, and a lot of times I guessed right, and he was just happened to be right there. After winning eight of nine games in their first two playoff series, the Sixers were ready to duel with another supremely talented team, the Los Angeles Lakers. The key ingredient was Moses Malone. They did not have an answer for him. During the course of that series, uh, Pat Riley, who is as fine a coach as ever coached the game of basketball, played Kurt Rambis against him. He played Kareem Abdul-Jabbar against him. He double teamed him. He did everything he could possibly think of from a coaching standpoint to stop Moses. It was no contest, a turkey shoot. The Sixers cruised past the Lakers in both games at the Spectrum. And when they won game three in L.A., it was obvious there would be no home court advantage at the Forum. After a slow start in game four, the coup de grace was applied by Dr. J. All of a sudden, fast break layup, a steal, hitting the jump shot. I'll never forget that jump shot that he hit, and uh, that was it. That clinched the world championship, that jump shot. As the clock wound down, it was a love at center court. Even the normally quiet Cheeks could not contain his excitement. And when I got to the basket, I just, I just rose up. I didn't mean to dunk it. I rolled up on emotion only. I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. But I think it brought the city a lot of joy. I think it brought a lot of people together. Just, it just uh, ignites the whole city, ignites us as players. And then as you go on in your career and other things you do in life, you can always look back at that moment and realize how much joy it brought to you and brought to the other players and people in the city that you played in. In 1967, as the 76ers were winning a championship, a local businessman named Ed Snyder was bringing the expanding National Hockey League to Philadelphia. He also built a new arena for his team, the Flyers, to call home. They were a bunch of young Canadians who came, saw, and conquered Philadelphia. We had a, a real strong contingent out of South Philly that supported the Philadelphia Flyers in the early years and still do. And they're hardworking people. They come and they, you know, they, they, want, they want nothing less than a hardworking team. And we provided that. And I think that's why you know, there was that love between the city and the, and the Philadelphia Flyers. No player personified that lunch pail work ethic more than a gap tooth center from Flin Flon, Manitoba. I was raised in, in a community, a mining community that uh, was away up in the north and the people up there were, to live in that type of climate and make your living there were tough, determined people.
people and uh, obviously they raised their kids to be that way. If Clark was the heart and soul of the Flyers, their stone wall was goaltender Bernie Perrant. The way our team was, was set up, any of our players who had gotten hurt could have been replaced, but we couldn't replace Perrant. He was the one key ingredient that our team could not have won without. The hard-checking, hard-working Flyers became known around the league as the Broad Street Bullies, and the head bully was tough guy Dave Schultz. It wasn't until I got out of junior hockey at age 20, playing in the Eastern, uh, Eastern Hockey League in Roanoke, Virginia, that uh, I started to uh, drop my gloves and, and uh, take on that role. I was going, wow, you know, I mean, this is great. I mean, uh, I'm getting a lot of attention. Uh, and I was doing good, and everybody liked it. Schultz's fame was such that he briefly became a recording star. Baby, how long will you keep me in the penalty box? Baby, I'm wrong, but it's lonely in the penalty box. I know I broke the rules, but rules are broken by fools. Baby, how long will you keep me in the penalty box? With Schultz tuning up opponents, Parrott making miraculous saves, and timely scoring by Clark, Barber, and Rick McLeish, the Flyers quickly emerged as surprise contenders for the Stanley Cup, all under the tutelage of enigmatic coach Fred Sherrill. He was unique. He was, uh, I'll, I'll even say different, in, in the fact that um, he never said a lot. He handed us things regularly, just little sayings. Okay, and, and that I, I, I could quote them all, and they always meant something to me. And one of the ones that, that he'd given us was, win together today and we will walk together forever. In April of 1974, the Flyers finished atop their conference. After easy playoff triumphs over the Atlanta Flames and the New York Rangers, it was on to the Stanley Cup Finals. And the sternest test yet in franchise history, the Boston Bruins at the Boston Garden. Going into this final against the Bruins, here were the odds that the Flyers had to face. In seven years in the league, they hadn't beaten Boston four times. Now they had to do that in two weeks. Sure enough, the Bruins won game one, but it took overtime to do it. And the Flyers knew they had a chance to steal game two, which also resulted in sudden death. I'm sitting on the bench in a fan where I hadn't you know, seen the ice in the last half of the third period. Never saw the ice. There was 10 minutes gone in overtime, and some fan said, yelled, put Schultz out there so the Bruins can score. So Fred puts me out there with Clark and Flett. Saw Flett out in the deep slot. The rest is history. Schultz behind the net. Centers. Flett. Tries to Clark. Shot. Oh! Rebound! Score! I've never really believed in uh, having an exuberant response to scoring a goal because lots of people scored goals, of course. Uh, I think when that went in, it was a relief to me and probably to our team because had we lost that game, we're two down and we're in deep trouble. And by winning there, we did what we had to do. We, we got a split in the first two games and put the home ice advantage back in the spectrum where we were almost uh, invincible. The Flyers had shocked the Bruins, even the series, and were headed home to friendly ice. Now it was the Flyers' turn to dominate, winning games three and four easily at the Spectrum. Game five went to the Bruins in Boston. Then it was back to Philadelphia for the all-important game six. And that's the whole idea of home ice advantage. But on the other hand, too, was uh, having the pressure coming home and winning that game. We did not want to get into a situation of going back to Boston, getting into game seven. And we might have been in a little bit of trouble. In addition to home ice advantage, the Flyers had the best good luck charm in sports history. The 
the Broad Street Bullies, this raucous, rowdy bunch of Canadian hockey players, and this singer from North Carolina who had been in her heyday in the 30s and 40s singing God Bless America. This odd juxtaposition came to be for me the greatest and most indescribable union of a good luck charm of that lady and this team that ever existed in sports. Each team knew the stakes, and defense ruled for both sides until late in the first period when the Flyers struck. Rick McLeish tipped in a shot by Moose Dupont, the only scoring the Flyers would need. With Kate Smith, with that game 1-0, the Flyers scoring first, and the Bruins attacking, 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 and Perrant not letting the puck go in. I think to this day, that if they'd have played till midnight, Boston wouldn't have scored. Boston's frustration was such that with three minutes left, Bobby Orr nearly tackled Bobby Clark, who was skating in for a breakaway. It was all over for the Bruins. And I remember the words, Orr out of the penalty box, fires the puck down the ice. Perron makes the save. From the time most of us put on skates, we dream of winning the Stanley Cup, of lifting the Stanley Cup, and it's the same for any kid that uh, played the game at that time, and an awful great feeling for us. The celebration spilled out of the spectrum and filled the streets of Philadelphia through the night. The next day, the Flyers celebrated with two million of their closest friends. As you went through the city in that parade on that Monday, you saw the bankers on Chestnut Street, uh, the Union League people. We went by the Burn Center at St. Agnes. And regardless of what your stature was or your status or your class system in Philadelphia, it was something that everybody took to their hearts. Philadelphia champion. December 27, 1960, the last time Eagles fans have seen a headline like this. The closest they've come since then was their only Super Bowl appearance in January 1981. That was definitely not a favorite memory, but how they got there certainly was. In 1980, his fifth season as head coach, Dick Vermeil had taken the Eagles from the bottom to the top of the National Football Conference. After a sparkling 12 and 4 season, Vermeil and company welcomed America's team, the Dallas Cowboys, to the vet to decide who would represent the NFC in Super Bowl 15. The Dallas Cowboys were sort of the epitome of the National Football League, so we set them up as the team to emulate and then to beat. And I remember saying specifically right before we went out, if these people take us for granted, we'll kick their ass. And that's exactly what I said to him. And I have never gone on a football field more confident in my life that we were going to win a football game because I've never been with a group of guys more ready to play a football game from an emotional standpoint. After stopping Dallas's opening drive, it took the Eagles offense 14 seconds to take this game by the throat. Second down and 10, the Cowboys with six defensive backs. Kowarski gives off inside, running over. The Eagles had quickly broken the game wide open, thanks to Montgomery's quickness and his offensive line. And I was supposed to run the ball off of my left tackle, which was Stan Walters and Peter Perot, who was the left guard. So how Woody People, who was playing right guard, and Jerry Sizemore, who was our best offensive lineman, made a tremendous block on Too Tall, and Woody People done a great job on John Dutton, allowed me to cut back to the right, see the hole, run through, and never got touched. The Cowboys' Tony Dorsett plunged to pay dirt midway through the second period, and at halftime, the score was tied at seven. In the second half, the Eagles' defense took over the game. 
our defense, what it did was we didn't wait for an offense to dictate to us. We would dictate to them. So we would go fly into an area and hopefully one of those 11 guys could handle a guy like Tony Dorsett, uh, Robert Newhouse, or whatever the situation would be. We felt Dorsett in the cold weather would be more apt to cough up the football. And uh, our plan was to go after him and legally, uh, as long as he was standing up, there was gonna be a green helmet and shoulder pad on him and more than one. They would swarm and just knock the heck out of him and maybe we could get him to cough up the football. And that's just what they made Dallas do in the second half with quarterback Danny White's cough up leading to a 10-7 Eagles lead. Meanwhile, Montgomery continued to pile up the yards. You hear all kind of things, 200 here, 200 there, 196 here, 190 there, but it was 194. So that's where that slashing, cutback style running came, always looking and keeping the legs moving all the time. Fullback Leroy Harris played the role of unsung hero, smashing the vaunted Dallas flex defense for 70 yards of his own, including this nine yard dash to build the lead to 17-7. The Eagle faithful were in a froth. And they were a big part of the game because, you know, those, those 68,000 people, they got right into the ball game along with us. And every uh, tackle, every move, every hit, we knew that we had our fans behind them. When Tony Franklin split the uprights at the two-minute warning to make it 20 to 7, America's team was finished. Going into this game, there was no question in my mind that we were going to beat the Dallas Cowboys. And when the game was all said and done, the Dallas Cowboys knew that not only did they get beat 20 to 7, but they were annihilated. The Eagles were NFC champions, and they did it through hard work. Whatever I did on the field was going to be a great example. People would say, hey, I'm representing the city of Philadelphia. I'm representing the Delaware Valley. And, and they're saying, hey, we give our all. They recognize effort, these people do. They recognize effort. And if you give them the effort they'd like you to give them, uh, they're going to be with you. And by that time, they were believers. The fans were believers. The city were believers. It was 1964. 14 years since the last Phillies pennant, and all summer long, it looked like we would not have to wait for a 15th. Jim Bunning was a perfect game pitching hero. Richie Allen was rookie of the year. Johnny Callison was winning an all-star game single-handedly, and the whole team was playing up a storm, all under the guidance of the little general himself, Gene Maw. They had started printing World Series tickets, but on September 21st, when Cincinnati's Chico Ruiz stole home to beat the Phils, a chill wind blew into the Phillies' golden year. It was something that almost took a, a life on all by itself, that 10-game uh, losing streak. You couldn't blame anybody, really. Uh, I blame Mock a little bit for using Bunny and Short, but he thought that he could win it, you know, right away, and it ended up it, be, it multiplied on us. I don't know if I can blame it on Gene Mock or not, but he, because that guy was, I thought he was one of the best baseball men I've ever seen. I mean, he was largely responsible for, for for getting them that lead in the first place. That was probably his, uh, altogether, his finest and worst hour in baseball. By October 4th, the St. Louis Cardinals had grabbed the pennant the Phillies couldn't hold, and Philadelphia's golden summer had turned to dust. I don't think I've ever seen a group of able-bodied men, 30 of them, I'll say, Walk off the field a sadder spectacle. It was the year of the blue snow, a collapse that has entered the realm of legend. It would take another decade, a new stadium, and a new team to exercise the ghosts of 64. By the mid 70s, owner Ruley Carpenter and general manager Paul Owen had put together a talented team that won three straight National League Eastern Division titles. 
but the pennant proved as elusive as ever. On November 5th, 1978, the Phils signed the man who would give them the one quality they lacked. They didn't quite know how to get over the hump, and uh, uh, when I came there for the 79 season, I brought uh, you know a couple world championships with me. But I think after watching me for 1979 and finding out that I was legitimate as far as being Charlie Hustle, I was legitimate as far as coming to the ballpark every day, hell or high water, and busting my chops and playing as hard as I possibly can, I think it kind of rubbed off on him. Without a doubt, he was the guy that pushed everybody that extra and kept motivating when, you know, when things were going bad. Come on, come on, come on, let's go to get to the playoffs. After an injury-plagued 1979 season, the Phils contended again in 1980. Following Rose's example and manager Dallas Green's famous dictum, we, not I. After five months of up and down play, a late season outburst from GM Owens got the club's attention once and for all. That's when we went into Frisco, and that's when Pope took over with his. Uh, the night before, he kicked the door and wanted to fight a couple players. Uh, <laughs> uh, that day, he challenged the whole club. Matter of fact, it was September 1st because it was the first day the kids were called up. Whatever I said, I guess it must have worked because they started playing pretty good after that. The Phils responded, playing brilliantly in September, and went to Montreal for a final weekend series in a dead heat with the Expos. It was a simple equation. Whoever won the series won the division. It was time for a superstar to take charge. The pitch to Schmidt. Long drive to left field. He buried it. He buried it way back. Out of here. Home run. Mike Schmidt puts the Phillies up 6-4. What a drive by Schmidt, unbelievable. He hit that thing deep to the seats in left field. And the Phillies Schmidt's two-run homer the was the biggest Mike clutch hit of his career, hands. winning the division and sending the Phillies on a mission, a their first pennant in, in 30 years. If an entire city could suffer agita for two weeks, that happened in October 1980 as the Phillies and the Houston Astros battled for National League supremacy. They played five times, and the first game was the only one to be decided in nine innings. Hit a ton to left field. Luzinski has homer. Phillies lead the ball game two to one. Greg Luzinski's two-run homer was the highlight of a 3-1 Phils victory in game one. So far, so good. Little dribbler to Boa, he comes home, it's gonna be late, it's safe all around. Houston got a badly needed win at the vet with four runs in the 10th inning of game two. The final three games of the series would be played in the unfriendly confines of the Astrodome. The Phillies arrived at the Astrodome with silent bats, and a Houston sacrifice fly in the 11th had the Phillies down two games to one, and on the verge of yet another bitter playoff defeat. The next day, with the Phillies' backs to the wall, the series turned truly bizarre in the fourth inning. Broken bat, one hopper to the pitcher. He throws the first. Out at first base is Gary Maddox. Now Houston arguing that they might. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's Harvey ruling? Wait a minute. A triple play? No, no way. They're ruling a triple play. They're After much screaming and pleading from the Phillies, umpire Doug Harvey changed his mind and the double play that became a triple play became a double play again. In the eighth, six outs from elimination, the Phils fought back and took a 3-2 lead. But when the Astros tied it in the ninth, it was extra innings again. Prime time for Pete Rose. A one-nothing pitch. Driven to left field, hard hit ball down into the corner. That ball one hops against the fence. Here comes Pete Rose digging around third. He's going to keep right on going. Here's the play at the plate. He scores! 
He knocked Bochy over. I was going to score on that. I don't give a damn. They could have had a, a roadblock the there, and I'd have broke the law. I'd have went right through the roadblock because I had to score that run. I mean, that gave us a lift because uh, when, when I scored that run, guys started to say, well, maybe things are going to go our way. The Phils went on to win 5-3. They had gotten off the canvas and would live to fight again in game five. No sooner had the Phils gotten up than the Astros knocked them back down again, taking a 5-2 lead in the seventh inning of game five. With six outs left in their season, the Phillies had to face Nolan Ryan. But Nolan Ryan's Nolan Ryan. He's the greatest, but, uh, uh, you know, he, he's not God. Incredibly, in the eighth, the Phils staggered back up when pinch hitter Greg Gross bunted to load the bases. And when Rose forced in a run with a walk, the great Nolan Ryan was out of there. He didn't want to be taken out of that game. I mean, uh, Nolan Ryan did not want to leave that game, and probably that's the best thing that happened to us. He left that game. The Phil scored two more runs to tie it, which brought Manny Trio to the plate. The one strike to Trio. Line drive left field. Base hit. Here comes Avalos to score. Heading for third base is Unser. That ball's in the corner. Here comes Unser for the plate. He's going to score. He goes into third. Manny Trio to third with a two-run triple. Phillies lead the game seven to five. The Phils had come from three down to two up in the eighth. But the Astros wouldn't die, tying it back up at the bottom of the inning off Tug McGraw. There was some doubt in my mind whether I was overtired or not. Those are things that uh, you're out there, you just, you just want to do it, and you kind of like, uh, you got to believe that something's good's going to happen. When the ninth went scoreless, extra innings loomed again for the fourth game in a row. In this pressure cooker, the 10th inning belonged to Gary Maddox with Dell Unser at third. Pitch on the way to Maddox. Line drive, center field, sinking, base hit. That ball's in play. Phillies lead. The ball gets Guy Poole. Maddox goes to second. Bottom of the 10th, one run lead, and it was up to Dick Ruthven to end 30 years of waiting. The wind up by Ruthven. The 3 2 pitch. Here is a punch shot to center field. Maddox racing over. Yeah. He catches the ball. Phillies win the pennant. The Phillies have won the pennant. The Phillies win the ball game 8 to 7. They go to the World Series for the first time in 30 years. As the overjoyed Phillies carried Gary Maddox off the field, they realized that one more prize was yet to be claimed. We got through a pressure cooker in, in Houston, and as Pete told us, he says, you get through the playoffs, then you're going to have a lot of fun in the World Series. The fun began on Tuesday, October 14th at Veterans Stadium versus the American League champion Kansas City Royals. Rookie Bob Walk was shaky, but pitched just well enough to let right fielder Bake McBride provide the fireworks. Pitch to Bake McBride. Fastball, swing it a long drive. Deep right field, way back, it is out of here, home run, Bate McBride, Phillies have taken a 5-4 to four lead. It was the big blow in a comeback 7-6 victory, the first World Series game win for the Phillies in 65 years. The next night, the Phillies followed the script, falling behind 4-2 until the 8th, when hits by Schmidt, McBride, rookie Keith Borland, and red-hot pinch hitter Dell Unser ignited a four-run rally and another heart-stopping win. The cardiac kids had done it again and were on their way to Kansas City. Fresh out of miracles in game three, the Phils lost four to three. The next day, the Royals were romping to a big lead, and reliever Dickie Knowles decided to send a message. The 0-2 pitch to Brett. Look out, George Brett has to hit the dirt on a high inside fastball, and Brett goes down in a hurry at home plate. Here comes Jim Fry, Kansas City manager, out of the dugout, and he is hot. He talks first to Don Dekinger, and now is looking out at Dickie Knowles. Pete Rose coming in from first base, now trying to get between Brian and Dickie Knowles. You know, 
Dickey, he don't give a damn about anything, especially when he's playing the game of baseball. I don't even think Dickey knew he was in a World Series. I mean, he looked at me like, are you crazy? What's this guy yelling at? I said, Dickey, he thinks you were yelling, throwing at him. He says, I was. It was a purpose pitch, and it worked. Brett and the Royals won game four, but it would be the high point of their series. Sunday, October 19th, game five. The series was now tied, and the Phils did not want to come home, trailing three games to two. With one on in the fourth, Mike Schmidt took charge. Fastball swing and a high towering drive to deep right center. This ball is out of here. Home run, Mike Schmidt, and the Phillies lead it two to nothing. The teams clawed at each other until the Phillies broke through with two runs in the ninth and entrusted a one-run lead to their ace closer. With two on and one out, it was cardiac time again. Hal McRae's drive drifted barely foul, and McGraw couldn't contain his relief. The exhausted McGraw went on to walk the bases full and then reached down for a pitch that had to be good. The fun part about going out on that field in, with, with history in the making was that you trusted your teammates and they trusted you. So you reach back for a little extra based on that trust. Doug is ready. A one-two pitch. Swing and a miss. He struck the ball with a fastball. Phillies win by a score of four to three. Tuck McGraw wins another one. And the Phillies are now up on Kansas City. Three games to two and going back to Philadelphia. That's what reaching backs for, recognizing the situation and saying, yeah, it's time for me now to be the best that I can be. And uh, it's a wonderful feeling. Tuesday, October 21st, game six of the World Series, and the Phillies were home again with 65,000 fans screaming for the World Series trophy. Supreme Southpaw Steve Carlton breezed through seven innings as the Phils build a 4-0 lead. But you didn't think this would be easy, did you? Late in the game, Carlton tired and gave way to McGraw, who loaded the bases and yielded a run in the eighth. He loaded them again in the ninth and faced Frank White with one out. Doug has the side. Here's the pitch to White. Swing and a high pop foul near the Phillies dugout. Rose and Boone both there. Boone drops the ball. Rose grabs it. What an incredible play. Pete Rose grabbed the ball after Boone dropped it. And there's two outs here in the ninth. That's either my ball or Boone's ball. And we both went after it. And he just happened to beat me there. And I hate to say because he's so damn slow. But he still beat me there. And... That wasn't that, uh, that unusual. I mean, it, it, the unusual thing is it popped out where I could see it and catch it. And so now I'm walking back out to the mound. Willie Wilson's going to come up, and we get the, we're going to go after the final out. When you're standing on the mound in front of 65,000 people and you're living 97 years of frustration, it's more than just the humidity. It's like there's dampness on your skin and your, your hairs are sticking straight up. It's like the humidity has humidity been uh, energized from the stands. It's like they're shooting electricity down into you and your whole body is just tingling. And then I thought, you know, this is what it's all about, man. Being scared is fun. Recognizing fear is like, we wouldn't even want to be here if we weren't scared. There's no reason to be here if it wasn't important. There was no more drama to be played out. McGraw and the Phillies had come too far to be denied now. Willie Wilson standing in, base is loaded. One, two, big just like all the baseball fans from the turn of the century it just lifted us right up off the ground and said thank you and you got to be a part of it it was just unbelievable and we happened to be in two world series in five years and three playoffs and uh, a mini playoff which we lost to, to Montreal so uh, if every five years of every player can be as exciting to them as the five years I had to Philadelphia, 
they'd walk through hell in a gasoline suit to play baseball. I'm Bill. And I'm Bob. We're, We're identical, identical twins. twins. Same buttons. Same features. Like Comcast Connect Star 411. What's that? The Comcast Metrophone feature that gives all kinds of information. I don't have that. You mean you can't get Franklin Institute weather updates? Weather? Or that service that takes dictation and sends it anywhere? Dick, 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 or directions to where we're going? Directions? Oh, hey, I need directions. You need Comcast Connect Star 411. Ugh. Comcast Connect Star 411. Because not all cellular phones are identical.